Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're sitting down with our resident scholar here at the What If Project, uh, the one and the only AJ Levine. And so, AJ, uh, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> I didn't know I was a resident scholar, but I kind of like the way that sounds. Pleasure <laughs> to be with you once again. There's a select group of people that I go to for either theology, scholarly things, or history, and you're you're on that list. <laughs> nice, nice to know. Absolutely. So, uh, you you recently wrote uh, what is like your 900th book? You, you've written a lot of books. <laughs> I don't, don't count. <laughs> you don't count. You lost count. count. But it's called Signs and Wonders: A Beginner's Guide to the Miracles of Jesus. And so, I thought that maybe we could begin uh, by telling us a little bit about why you wrote this book. And also, even some of the resources around the book. I know there's videos, I believe. There's a, a leader's guide for people that might want to use it in a study group. So talk to us about, give us the drive-by about this book. Yeah. Well, the easiest thing is to explain what you can get. So there's the book, which is the book. Yep. And then there's a leader's guide. So if you want to set up like discussion questions or start in a like a church setting with a prayer or end with a prayer, mm -hmm. uh, the leader's guide is, is basically how you do Bible study without having to do a whole lot of extra work. Um, and then there's a video for those of us who actually don't have time to get the reading done before the book club meets or whatever. Go watch the movie uh, instead. <laughs> right, yeah, watch the movie instead. Uh, but the videos actually give me an opportunity to talk about stuff that's not in the book. Um, because Abingdon, the press, only gives me a certain number of words, and there's always more to say than what I can put in the book. It's mm -hmm. like at the end of the Gospel of John, where John says, Jesus did many other signs, but we're not going to tell you what they right. are. <laughs> so fill in the gaps. Um <laughs> So why did I do this book? Well, because people kept writing to me saying, do something on the miracles. Mm -hmm. And the reason most of them wrote is because they found the miracles either just silly, like nobody believes this stuff happened, mm -hmm. um, or pagan, where it looks like, you know, the Greek gods are doing something, and it looks like Jesus is just like Dionysus creating one. <laughs> um, or more often, because they felt difficulties in their own life and wondered why if jesus can raise somebody's daughter from the dead why can't jesus raise their daughter from mm -hmm. the dead if jesus can heal blindness or deafness or allow somebody who cannot walk to walk yeah um why is this person suffering from uh acls mm -hmm. or you know why is why has this broken leg not healed but rather turned gangrenous mm -hmm. so the the stories were pr pr posing numerous problems and i thought well Perhaps we can get beyond the did he or did he not do miracles and say, what might these stories, whether they're healing miracles or nature miracles mm -hmm. or food production miracles, what might they have to say to people today and how might they have been understood in their own context? Yeah, and I think that's really good because a lot of these stories carry a lot of baggage for people because we've been taught certain things about them. And then as you start to grow in your faith, evolve in your faith and life starts to happen to you, you start to ask questions like you like you said, like, well, if you did it, then why isn't it happening now? Like, is there am I not hitting the right buttons on the vending machine? <laughs> you know, is something is something right. going on well, that I'm missing? Worse, worse that you think somehow my faith is not strong enough. So therefore, the reason I'm suffering or my friends or my family are suffering That's is because right. there's something wrong with how I'm approaching this whole thing. That's right. And then not only do you have the problem of the sickness or the disability, you have the, you have the guilt that goes along with I haven't been faithful enough. And right. that's just bad Bible reading. Yeah, definitely. So before we get into the miracles, let's talk a little bit about the the books that these miracles are found in, which is obviously the Gospels. And I was brought up, I think a lot of our listeners as well, to believe that the Gospels were like these eyewitness accounts of Jesus. They're like the Jesus cam, you know, following Jesus around to right, right. document all the things that he did and things that he said. So we'd have these reliable sources, but you open up the book and you sort of reframe what the Gospels are, which I thought was brilliant. So maybe it could just take a, a few minutes to take us into that. What are the Gospels? What's the best way to use them? Uh, give us the, the layover of the land. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can start with the, the the basic view that any book, you know, including my own or including your po the podcast, mm -hmm. it's all a form of propaganda. Yeah. Uh, because we're saying what we want people to hear, and we're trying to change the conversation in particular ways so that people will agree with us. Yeah. Um, so the Gospels are not eyewitness accounts, uh, and in fact, they generally don't claim to be. Uh, the Gospel of John gives a hint that maybe the beloved disciple was there for some of these activities, but not mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. The Gospel of Luke even starts out by saying, well, you know, you've heard these stories before. I'm going to tell you how they work accurately and in order. And if Luke <laughs> Mark and Matthew, which strikes me as likely, then Luke is basically saying, you know what, Mark, it's okay, but I can do it better. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not giving us eyewitness accounts. And even if we 
had eyewitness accounts. We know even from studies today that eyewitnesses are notoriously unreliable, mm -hmm. um, which is why they don't always work when you have a court case and you have two so-called eyewitnesses to the same event and they tell completely different stories. Mm -hmm. um, we can see the same thing on news today, by the way. So you want a coverage of a particular event um, where you have people on site. Well, what you get on Fox News is not what you get on MSNBC, mm -hmm. even though there are people on site. So it's all spun. Mm -hmm. The gospel writers are not writing to record exactly what happened. Uh, they're writing to record the story of Jesus for the sake of people who are generally already in the Jesus movement to say, you follow this person, you worship this person. Let me tell you his story in a particular way that will help you have a closer relationship with him and mm -hmm. have a better understanding of him. Yeah. Except Mark's understanding is not the same as Matthew's understanding. Their understandings are not the same as John's. And the one of the brilliant things that the early followers did is they gave us four different portraits. Mm -hmm. Say, Jesus is not this kind of cookie cutter guy where there's only one way of telling the story. Any more than any of us are cookie cutter sorts of people. So that if you ask your children to describe who you are and then you if in my case you ask the students um mm -hmm. or you ask my dentist you know whoever uh or people in my parents generation they're all going to give you different portraits because they're going to highlight different things that they think would be important yeah now would you say that there did they take like i don't know writing liberties so to speak to <laughs> craft the story in a particular way because the way i've been trying to understand and you can correct me if, I, if this is not the best way is that in addition to everything you just said the the readers that these people are writing to are going through particular circumstances, right? Like they're up against certain things in their lives, in their world, that the the writer most likely has an inside look at, but you and I are a little bit removed from. And so I would think, and I don't know if this is true, but I would think that maybe Matthew might have recorded a story differently than maybe Mark or Luke or whatever, because he was trying to write the story of Jesus to speak to that particular group of people going through that particular circumstance would you would you say that's somewhat accurate mm, sort of sort of uh, <laughs> the problem is we don't know who wrote the gospels the names yeah. matthew mark luke and john sure. get assigned later we don't For know sure. where they were written um, mm -hmm. you can get some, some hints maybe mm -hmm. but you know was mark written in upper galilee or was mark written in rome or was mark written in ephesus um, and we don't know if they're writing to specific audiences either. Um, mm -hmm. Luke tells us he's writing to a patron whose name is Theophilus. Isn't that nice? Lover of God. Perfect name for, you know, patron. <laughs> um, we don't know whether that's a real person or whether Luke has, has an ideal reader. Yeah. Um, we don't know if Matthew is writing. The, the older view was that Matthew is writing to this group of Jews who have gone into the Jesus movement. And then they're trying to deal with what does it mean that the movement's going Gentile? But we don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew was the most popular gospel. We do know this uh, in the pagan world of the second century. And we know mm -hmm. that by manuscript attestation and people who were quoting Matthew, like Ignatius of Antioch. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no reason to presuppose that Matthew is just writing to a bunch of Jews. Um, it, we might think of this in the same way that when I write or when you write or when anybody writes, you might have an audience in mind. So my, the audience I have in mind is somebody who actually cares about the Gospels, who may have even read one on occasion. Mm -hmm. But I also have to write to people who have no idea what this stuff is, who might you know, wander into a Bible study or see a book on Amazon about miracles and think, well, that looks helpful. <laughs> um, so I actually don't know who's reading this material, um, yeah. I, except when people contact me. And I know that they're coming in from various perspectives. Mm. So it, the Gospel writers are writing what they think needs to be said. Uh, are they writing to a specific person or to a specific community? I'm not so sure. I think they're writing to anybody who's going to read their stuff. Mm. So rather than sit down and write like to a particular audience in mind, they were sitting down to write the gospel or to write the story of Jesus to anybody who's going to read it. Right. And to yeah. control what they're reading. Right. Okay. So let's assume that Mark is the first gospel, which pretty much all biblical scholars mm -hmm. think. Right? Um, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark. Well, if I compare, 90% of Mark shows up in Matthew. So mm -hmm. if I compare Mark to Matthew or Matthew to Mark, I can see Matthew changing the stories. Or if you want to go in reverse, I can see Mark changing the stories. Mm -hmm. So Mark tells us that in Nazareth, which is Jesus' hometown, uh, he can't do many miracles because the people don't believe in him. He can just heal a couple of people, which I actually think is pretty good. You know, heal a couple of people. <laughs> you're already ahead of the group, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but Mark says it's an issue of, of capability. He cannot. Matthew, Matthew tells the same story, but says because of their lack of faith, he does not. 
So market's an issue of capability uh, and what Jesus can and cannot do. Matthew, it's a question of volition, what Jesus chooses to do or not do. Mm. Mark tells us that Jesus healed a person possessed by demons um, in a town called Gerasa. Uh, This is the longest exorcism in in the Gospels. Um, And Matthew changes the location to Gadara, which actually Mm. has a cliff. Gerasa doesn't. This is for the pigs to go over the cliff. It Mm. helps if there's a cliff in the town. (laughs) Um, uh, And Matthew makes it two people possessed by demons. Why? Because Matthew likes to ramp up Jesus' capability. If you can exercise one demon named Legion, how much more impressive is it if you can exercise two demons yeah. named Legion? Yeah. Um, so what we're getting is spinning the story here. Um, Luke takes that rejection in Nazareth and drops the story entirely mm. uh, and instead rewrites a scene in the hometown synagogue. And that's this Luke's signature text in, in Luke chapter four, um, where they talk about miracles that Jesus did in Capernaum, but we don't know what they are. Mm. So I've got people with the basic storyline And then they're spinning the story as they think that people who who might read their stuff might consider. That's not dissimilar to what happens in a church. So you go into a church and say five churches are reading the same text from the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you will get five different sermons and not just one that four other people downloaded from the Internet. Yeah, Uh, because those pastors are going to or priests are going to spin things the way they think the congregation might want to hear or because they've got a new idea that they want to bring out an experiment or because there really is somebody in the back of the church who needs to hear that particular message on that particular day. (laughs) So we're always retelling the stories. That's what makes stories interesting and it keeps them alive. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, because I remember in one of my homiletics classes in seminary, that was one of the we had like a a project we had to do and the professor gave everybody in the class, he broke us up into groups of like two or three. So there's like 10 groups, gave everybody the same passage Mm -hmm. and said, this group is going to be Calvinists. You guys over there are Methodists. And he gave everybody perspective from which to try to bring, to look at this passage. And we all came up with different sermons. He's like, they all, they all, they all fit. He said, they all, they all work. But he said, the point here is that you can, everybody can look at this same passage of scripture, the same story and come away with a much different takeaway. I think that's pretty much like what you said is going on with these gospels. I think so. Um, and I think that's actually true to the historical Jesus, who's going to strike mm-hmm. people differently depending upon where they are. I mean, if, if you're the father of a girl who Jesus heals or raises from the dead, you're going to have a different image of him uh, than if you're somebody who says, well, you know, wait a minute, are these miracles really happening? Is he in cahoots with Satan? Is he in cahoots right. with the person who was sick in the first place? So it's a fake healing, right? Uh, people are going to have different views about this thing. Um, it, it we would do the same thing today. If if somebody's in the hospital, mm-hmm. heaven you know heaven help you if if that's the case, mm-hmm. uh, and something happens to change the course of that person's health, mm-hmm. well, you might think it's a miracle. The doctors might say it has something to do with the new medication. Mm-hmm. Uh, other people might say, well, it's just one of those things that happens and we can't explain it. But maybe at some point we'll come up with an explanation. Mm-hmm. Is it miracle? Is it medicine? Is it magic? much depends upon the person you ask. Yeah, that's right. Perspective is everything, right? Well, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's not everything, but it's a lot. It's not everything because if <laughs> it were, then historians would just be making stuff up. Right. <laughs> Very true. All right. So let's talk about the, the miracles. Um, one of the biggest questions that I get, one of the biggest questions I've had in my own journey, um, especially in rethinking the Bible, things like that, is did these stories really happen? And you kind of alluded to that earlier. That's one of the big questions that come up when people talk about signs and wonders and miracles. So um, like, did Jesus really walk on the water? You know, did he cast out demons? Did he really feed 5,000 people? And if, if they didn't all happen, can we say that maybe some of them happen? How do we know which ones happened? So when somebody presents you with that kind of a question, like a student and maybe in your class or whatever, what is your response to that? How, yeah. how do you, how do you talk that person through it? Well, it depends upon whether the student is asking me a homiletic question. How do I preach this? or a personal faith perspective, what, what do I do with this? Because my, my belief is now being challenged. Mm-hmm. Um, or an historical question. Uh, and, and the answer is- What's their different. perspective, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it, you, you want to answer the question that's being asked. Sure. And sometimes you're not sure exactly what's being asked. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so I, I think Jesus was known as a healer. Mm -hmm. Um, Just as there are people today, cross-culturally, who are known as healers, and we can put into this category um, shamans and people who work with herbs, non-professional medical personnel, like women healers 
throughout the centuries who frequently got accused of things like witchcraft, right? Because if you don't go through the authoritative channels, then there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. People want to shut you down. So I think he was known as a healer. He was certainly not the only one. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we can do is look at how healing functioned in antiquity. I mean, there are healing shrines. Uh, there are physicians. Think about the lady with the hemorrhage who goes to physicians. They, they don't mm -hmm. work on her. Um, Colossians talks about Luke, the beloved physician, who apparently, you know, did something right. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you did have some medical care at the time. Um, I, Jesus does not like regrow limbs. I mean, somebody who's, who's missing an arm doesn't get an arm back. Mm -hmm. um, but he does deal with people who could be suffering from trauma. Um, we would call it psychosomatic concerns. Um, in a number of cases, and we have we have documentation of this. If you have somebody who's on um, who's like neurologically diverse and might have difficulty, say, sitting still, mm -hmm. um, in the presence of certain people, they calm down mm. with a sense of there's an enormous authority here, yeah. uh, and that authority is sufficiently trustworthy enough to break through the neurological boundaries mm. and create calm in the person. Um, you can even see the same sort of thing today if you're dealing with somebody who's quite tense, and this is also culturally determined, um, in many cases, just to reach out and touch the person on the arm. Mm. I mean, sometimes with, with autistic people, you might not want to do that because they don't sure. want to be touched. Uh, but I've seen that in hospital, right? Mm. Um, or even just, um, it, you know, at Starbucks, mm. just a slight touch um, can calm somebody. It's that, that sense of human contact. That's in part why COVID was so awful, is you mm. missed that contact. Um, I think Jesus gave people hope mm. and hope can actually react on the body. Um, so the endorphins kick in or whatever else those medical things are that can help you. Mm -hmm. um, I think the stories of him doing healings gave people hope. I think they were actually really wonderful propaganda as the church developed. Why would you follow this guy? Because you might get a healing. Right. It's not a bad thing, right? right? And we see people following people who would be called today faith healers, and they would mm -hmm. go to these you know, big auditoriums, and somebody was there, the gallbladder and you know, the upper balcony, I think you're healed. And, Whoa, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it happens. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the next day you're worse. But yeah. Um, I, I think for the nature miracles, it's a sense of how do we have control over that over which we do not have control. Mm. So when talking about the storm at sea, um, I actually mentioned that my grandfather, my mother's father drowned. Um, I, my family was in the fishing business. I'm from the Atlantic coast in Massachusetts. I have an enormous respect for storms at sea mm. because I know what they can do. And the very idea that there's some sort of control there, is, you, you need that on occasion. Yeah, uh, because we don't have it. And it's nice to know that there might be something there and it's not totally chaotic mm. um, for feeding. Um, I don't think it was like everybody took out their lunch boxes and shared tuna fish sandwiches, <laughs> um, because I don't think it's helpful to try to find scientific explanations for something that the text calls a miracle, yeah. um, because the, if the text calls it a miracle, let it be a miracle and then try to work with how those stories might have provided hope. Um, how those stories might have uh, served as uh, encouragement to go follow Jesus rather than uh, Asclepius mm -hmm. or Hippocrates or anybody else who's doing healings in antiquity like the gods mm -hmm. or their agents. Um, I think they're interesting stories. I mean, we like stories where something unnatural occurs mm -hmm. um, or where uh, something that's not supposed to happen happens. I mean, it's the same way we like stories about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Um, <laughs> It, because they give us hope and they give us a way of approaching the world in a renewed sense. So even if we don't believe them that they actually happened, yeah, the stories can still work on us. I think yeah. that's Yeah, I've been finding like the more I read, I've, sp I've been spending a lot of time in the gospels. It's like pretty much the only thing I read in regards to the Bible these days. And I've been trying to let, like when I come across a miracle story, Instead of like, I used to wonder like, did this really happen? And if it did happen, you know, like blah, 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 blah. But now I'm trying to think of what, what part of my heart or my mind is the writer maybe trying to expand in me? And yeah, what happens, cool. what happens if I, if I allow this story as far fetched as it may be to inspire something in me, just like Santa Claus inspires my daughter or, or whatever, mm -hmm. if it can inspire me, what, what might it help me believe for the impossible in my own life or in our own world? Like we have so many things in our world that are just seem impossible, but if we just cave to the impossibility of it, then we're inactive and we don't really do anything about it. But if I can let this story inspire something and awaken something in me, how might that be able to drive me forward 
in my own life, in my own world, to try to make a difference. That's great. I like that very much um, mm. because otherwise we're st- with the did it or didn't happen. If you say it didn't happen, then be- who cares, right? right. Uh, and if you say it did happen, the only thing you really got for a takeaway is, boy, isn't Jesus really powerful? Yeah. Well, if you begin with the idea that Jesus is the only begotten son of God, he's already powerful. He's already unique. You don't need a miracle story to tell you that. Right. Um, and if you dismiss it, then you just, just dismiss everything. Yeah. So there has to be some other way of getting at these stories as opposed to the did this or did this not happen right moreover if we go with john and i think he's probably right here that jesus did other things that didn't get recorded Mm -hmm. right um well then why did they record these ones right right? i mean jesus did lots of things that don't make it into the new testament right he probably peed and pooped (laughs) are there various things that he did that we just don't have you know details on yeah so why these stories and why record them in this particular way? And what happens when we go from story to story and we watch the changes? Yeah. Why is it that John doesn't have any exorcisms? Mm-hmm. Is John presuming that, well, the readers already know Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so he can go in different directions? Why does John talk about signs rather than mighty works, uh, mm-hmm. which is the term that usually gets translated miracle in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Um, what's John trying to tell us about these miracles that he thinks maybe Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke missed? Mm. Um, one of the stories that I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time on in the book, because again, I only have six chapters plus an intro and a conclusion, <laughs> is the wedding at Cana, mm. um, where the big debate is whether it was wine or grape juice. You know, look, I'm Jewish. I don't have a horse in that race. I <laughs> think it's wine, because uh, nobody's going to say, boy, you saved the best grape juice for last. That just right. makes no sense. Um <laughs> Uh, and, you know, like, and what do we do with that? Mm-hmm. Um, and let's talk about celebration. Uh, let's talk about uh, every once in a while, putting something in your mouth that tastes really, really good. Mm. Um, or what does it mean to be at a wedding? Um, or what does it mean when you have the socially embarrassing problem where like, gee, like you've run out of chicken for the banquet, right? And then <laughs> right. suddenly... You know, Mary, his, who's never called Mary, she's just the mother of Jesus, you know, says to him, they've run out of wine. She knows exactly, right? She doesn't have to say, hey, do something. She's, they've run out of wine, right? <laughs> um, it's like my saying to a teaching assistant, we've run out of uh, blue books. I don't need to say you should have, you know, got them in the first place, right? Yeah. Uh, so all sorts of other questions that, that surround the miracles that you can play with mm. or the wine symbolism. That's just fun. Yeah. Uh, for the feeding of the 5,000, what are they in there for? Are they in it for lunch and after lunch? It's like, okay, we're done with you. Hmm. Um, is it what leads the crowd to think that maybe Jesus is a king because kings are supposed to provide food for hungry people? Mm-hmm. Um, and boy, that's not a title he wants, um, at least in terms of earthly kings. Um, are we supposed to think about where food comes from? Are we supposed to think about the manna in the wilderness, which John actually draws a con- to which John draws a connection? Um, is this God feeding God's people? Mm-hmm. All sorts of things you can do here without yeah. the, did they open up their lunch boxes and share their sandwiches? Yeah. I think when you, when you remove yourself from that, did this or did this not happen? All those different questions that you just described from a number of different stories can arise to the surface of your mind because you can sit and meditate on a story for hours and upon hours. And you can come up with all these different questions about, you know, um, what what this can tell you about Jesus or what the writer might have been trying to tell you about Jesus. And you, if you let your mind go there and move away from the did it or did it not happen, I think for our listeners, I think that's just a really important and you know, helpful thing to do uh, in regard to these stories. So what I'm asking now is, is about Paul. And you have a section about this in your in your book. Um, and I, I've noticed this before, but I never, I never really let my mind dwell on it. So maybe we could dwell on it a little bit here, but Paul doesn't talk about the miracles. And nope. I think that's so interesting that matthew mark luke and john do obviously then you get to paul who's credited with over half the new testament he doesn't really say a word about the miracles and i feel like i don't i feel like that tells me something (laughs) but i don't know what it tells me (laughs) so maybe we could explore that a little bit together (laughs) sure um the premise of your question Mm -hmm. creates a logical problem is you're presuming that absence of evidence is the same thing as evidence of absence yes Right. All right. Yeah. Um, just because Paul doesn't mention it does not mean that they did not happen or mm-hmm. Paul did not know about them. Yeah. Uh, Paul is writing what we would call ad hoc letters. He's writing to specific communities, uh, with the exception of Romans, to churches he founded, mm-hmm. assemblies he founded. 
Um, and he's writing to address particular problems that they've got. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't figure out where Paul would have needed to have put in a miracle story to make his case. Yeah. Right. Um, Paul doesn't talk about Sabbath either, right? Mm -hmm. Until you get to Colossians. And I'm not sure Paul wrote Colossians mm -hmm. um, when he could have talked about all those Sabbath controversies that Jesus has. There's a bunch of stuff Paul doesn't mention. Does the congregation already know about the stuff? I'm pretty sure they already know about the healings. Mm -hmm. uh, do they do they need to be told again about the healings? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So Paul's got other things that he needs to talk about. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're in a church on the lectionary. You get certain readings from, to use Christian terminology, Old Testament, New Testament, mm -hmm. Psalms, and the epistles. Um, you might on one morning where a, the gospel reading is a miracle story say, you know what? I think I really need to preach on Paul today because this church doesn't need a miracle story. This church needs a, you know, a less, lesson in ethics mm -hmm. or a lesson concerning factionalism or a lesson concerning running the budget. Mm -hmm. So you talk about what you need to talk about. And Paul has certain things to talk about. Miracles are not them. However, mm -hmm. Paul does talk about visions. Right. I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I'm not sure who got caught up to the third heaven and saw all sorts of really cool things that he can't talk about. <laughs> okay. So that's second Corinthians. I think Jesus also saw visions. Uh, like I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, mm -hmm. or he sees the heavens open and the spirit of God coming as a dove. Right. Um, so Jesus is a visionary. And I think he might have even helped his followers learn how to see visions, because this is actually something in the mystical tradition you can learn how to do. You can train your mind to do this. Mm. Um, and that might explain, for example, the story of the transfiguration, where the disciples see Jesus kind of leaking out di divinity. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if you can get anything to be pure white in the Middle East with all that dust in the sand, it's okay. clearly it's supernatural. It's a miracle. <laughs> um, so he's leaking out divinity. And that's like his true self. Mm -hmm. So if you have a group of people surrounding you who know how to see visions and who have honed that ability and they're following a leader who also sees visions, that could also help explain some of these miracle stories. Yeah. And I you guess know, too, like, we... yeah, I was going to say too, like on that, on that line of thinking, I think, you know, we just talked about how John said that there's a ton of things that Jesus did that aren't recorded in these books and, and whatever. And at the same note, there's, there's a lot of things that Paul said and that Paul did that aren't recorded in Paul's letters, right? Because we look at Paul's letters as if like this is Paul, but that's just a microcosm of who right. It's Paul it's a pre-digested Paul. It's the yeah. we know Paul wrote other letters that the New Testament doesn't have. Sure. Because right? Paul tells us in First in Corinthians, you know, I wrote to you before, you know, don't do this. Right. Well, where? <laughs> right. And did part of that earlier letter somehow find its way into Second Corinthians, which looks kind of composite. So we're already getting a pre-digested Paul. We're getting the Paul that the the you know second century, third century followers of Jesus wanted us to have. Right. Um, we've got Paul spun by Luke. Mm -hmm. So Paul, the the very very Pharisaic, very Jewish. I think this is historically accurate. But if you go to something like the Acts of Paul and Thecla, mm -hmm. uh, the non-canonical stuff, you get a very very different Paul, whose major agenda is don't have sex. Right. Um, which, which I don't really think is quite true to Paul. Mm. I mean, Paul prefers celibacy, but he's perfectly okay with marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting Paul already pre-digested, and then we've got the Paul as spun through, as spun mm. through Acts, as spun through you know Martin Luther and whoever else is going to be reading Paul. Mm. Um, there's something else that we can do besides looking at how these visionary, visions function, and that might be helpful for us today, for people who, as the prophet Joel would put it, dream, dream dreams and see visions, right? Mm. See something other, otherwise, see, see the world working in a different way. Um, one of the difficulties with the miracle stories, and I do touch on this because I found this to be a huge problem, is um, the New Testament, as part of its own cultural worldview, mm. uses language of disability, physical disability, uh, to talk about uh, moral problems or spiritual obtuseness. We do the same thing today. Right? Mm. Um, so you look in the refrigerator and, you know, you say to your partner, where's the cream cheese? To which the response is, are you blind? It's on the second shelf. <laughs> okay, so it, it, blind people will know where the cream cheese is because they know where they put it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we're using language of disability to suggest, you know, here obtuseness. Yeah. Um, or Jesus would use language of those who have ears to hear, hear, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have a healing of somebody who's deaf who can now 
who can now hear. And the sense is that deafness is associated with with spiritual disability or moral problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, even language of hardness of heart, which su- suggests to me, well, you know, that you've got some sort of blockage. <laughs> I've got two artificial heart valves. I understand what heart blockage means. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when somebody says hardness of heart, I'm thinking like, did I take my Coumadin this morning right. to, <laughs> to make sure the blood's flowing? Um, <laughs> So how do you get around using the language of disability to talk about something which, which is which is bad, mm. right? Um, and at the same time, we can use language of disability to talk about something that's actually quite profound. Um, mm. Jesus would talk about people, who, and th- the book doesn't go into this, but this is where mm. you can spin this material um, in Matthew 19 about people who are eunuchs for the, the sake of the kingdom, as so mm. people who are, who are lacking um, certain physical body parts, but they're the ideal. Mm. Um, or if your hand defends you, cut it off, right? It's better to go into heaven, you know, without that extra hand. Mm-hmm. And here we're using images again of disability as something that's positive rather than something that's negative. Mm. So how do we get around that that negative? Uh, Jesus, if, if a blind person leads a blind person, they'll both fall into a pit. No, they won't. Mm. You know, blind people know what they're doing. Um <laughs> That's why you have canes, right? And that's why yeah. you have guides. Um, yeah. And that's why you don't go out in an area that you're not unfamiliar with without some sort of, of you know, pre-planning. Um, so how to take these miracle stories and not present them in such a way that it would harm a sightless person in the congregation or mm. a person in the congregation who can't walk. Mm. That's also something that we need to consider. Yeah. Is that, <clears throat> would the the stories about like demons and things like that, would that kind of fall into the same line you think like in terms of like the language of disability because i've often Absolutely. yeah because i've often i've been wondering a lot about like demons and stuff because like i went grew, i grew up again like in the in the world i was in i took classes on you know the kingdom of darkness and power encounter and literally that part like of fun. kingdom of darkness you know Monday yeah, 11, right right <laughs> and literally part of like exorcisms <laughs> and things like that and so i have like tons of books on my shelf you know that like take you through deep theologies about these kinds of things but Now I, you know, I'm at this place where I don't see demons and Satan as like these literal beings who are trying to taunt me with pitchforks and things like that. Like I, I'm trying to view it much differently, but when I come across these stories, it's very hard for me to separate my mind from where I used to be, how I used to read them and read them through a different lens. So I guess the next thing I wanted to ask you is when it comes to these kinds of stories, based upon what you just told us about the language of disability, like what are some different maybe ways to read the stories of these demonic encounters other than these are literal demonic beings that jesus is casting out of people yeah that's a really good question um and there are a couple of ways of approaching it um Mm -hmm. if we think about people who behave in what our culture would consider to be aberrant Mm -hmm. um today we we provide psychological psychiatric diagnoses Mm -hmm. or chemical diagnoses Mm -hmm. uh back then it may well have been possession now you can play with possession in different ways. I mean, Jesus is also possessed. He's possessed by the Holy Spirit, and that's what allows him to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's good possession and there's bad possession. It just depends upon who's possessing you. Um, What we need to worry about is adding stigma to people who are already classified as uh, socially aberrant or classified as mentally ill. You don't want to throw Satan in there on top of it Mm -hmm. because that's just stigmatization. Mm -hmm. But here are some other ways you can think about it. Today, in the modern industrialized West, most people don't talk about demon possession because it sounds kind of superstitious or it sounds pagan Mm -hmm. or it sounds like, you know, not what good white Western intellectual people will think. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you go to lots of other places in the world, particularly indigenous cultures, um, there are spirits that possess, whether for better or for ill. Mm -hmm. Um, So one thing that these stories can do is remind us of our own cultural imperialism Mm -hmm. um, and allow us to question is our view of how the world works, in fact, the way the world works, Mm -hmm. or is it just our view of how the world works? Mm -hmm. Um, I have very, very good friends who are convinced that they have seen ghosts, who are convinced that Satan has literally appeared to them in various forms Mm. um, and tempted them to do certain things, um, who are convinced that the Holy Ghost has appeared to them Mm. um, in various ways and convinced them to do other things. Who am I to say that they're they're wrong Um, Mm. or to say that what what we've got here is a chemical glitch? Mm. 
Um, so the way I do history, and I'm your basic, you know, Western historian, is I don't include the supernatural in what I do. Mm. But I want to acknowledge that other people do. And even though I don't, um, I'm aware that I'm making a choice here, or at least my mind has made a choice for me because my mind doesn't work on the supernatural registry. Mm. Um, so rather than say, well, there's no demon or there's no Holy Spirit or there's no God or there's mm -hmm. no Satan, because we're never going to resolve that one. And historians can't because mm -hmm. it's not a matter of history. It's a matter of faith or belief. My move is then to say, well, if you believe in X, Y, and Z, how is that going to help you understand the story? And as you put it, and I thought you put it really well, if you believe in X, Y, and Z, how is understanding the story going to help you in your own personal faith journey? And how is it yeah. going to make you a better person ethically? Yeah. And how is it going to how is it going to give you a better understanding of Jesus or of God or of forces of evil that surround us? And although I do not believe in Satan, I certainly believe in forces of evil that are surrounding us. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes me feel a lot better because I, I was I was in this place, like I said, where I would look at those stories and think, yes, this is exactly you know, there, there are demons. Jesus did cast them out. We have to know how to do the same, you know, blah, 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 blah. But then I went through this other side where I was like, no, all that stuff is, is not real. You know, they were trying to tell us something different. They're painting a picture to try to bring about some kind of teaching they want us to get about Jesus, whatever. But now I'm in this place where, like you said, I don't know. I mean, the universe is so big. I mean, they just have that new telescope where they can see so many different things. The universe is just constantly expanding. It's big. It's massive. We're just this small little thing. Who am I to say that those things aren't real? I don't really know. But when I when I when I look at them and I read them, like I said, how can it make me a better person in this part of my life, in this part of my world? And what can I glean from this text, from this story, to try to make the world? A better place. I, I feel like for me, that's a much better way to approach this stuff. Yeah. And in fact, you're, I think right now you're asking some really good questions, which mm. go beyond the did this happen or not? Yeah. Which doesn't strike me as a terribly interesting question. Um, <laughs> so the other thing is that once we start talking about demons, I was mm. like, I like talking about demons. I think they're interesting. Right? <laughs> and Halloween and all that. Like sure. the demon stuff. Um, it, it, I think the language of, of demonology or mm -hmm. accusing people of being possessed. Um, or of working on Team Satan mm -hmm. um, uh, takes away our own authority, right? So if 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 there's a politician who I don't think is is good for the country mm -hmm. for whatever reason, or an entertainer, or an athlete, or whoever, mm -hmm. um, if I say the devil made that person do something, or he's possessed by the devil, then I then I have no power over him because I can't defeat a supernatural force. There's nothing I can do, right? Mm -hmm. So once you demonize somebody, you've put them in the supernatural realm. You've in effect made them godlike. They're more than human, right? Because mm -hmm. demons are more than human. What I want to do is take away that demon language and say, and even even suggest even the language of this is a bad person mm -hmm. and say, what this person is doing is harmful. Mm -hmm. And just get the Satan thing out of it and get the demon thing out of it. Because if I can say what this person is doing is harmful, now I have an entry. What, what can I do to stop this person from continuing to do harm? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a yeah. different way of approaching this material. Yeah. Um, if you call it Satan, then, then you need another supernatural force to get at it. Um, what you can do, however, in case you want to do the Satan thing, is the, the New Testament actually tells you how you defeat Satan. <laughs> it's easy. You just get the Old Testament. Right? Um, and that's why we have the temptation narratives where Jesus is tempted by Satan. And what does he do? He quotes Deuteronomy. Yeah. Um, so for all of my friends who were saying, well, you know, get rid of the Old Testament. It's not really interesting. No, you need it to defeat Satan. So that's mm -hmm. just another thing you can put in your hamper to say, in case a demon does appear to you, just get out Deuteronomy and you're good to go. Mm. You know, it's funny because as you're talking, I was thinking about how once you demonize something, you, you like you said, you make, you make it supernatural. But mm -hmm. it also, in a sense, removes the responsibility from yourself Yep. to do something and you put that responsibility back on another supernatural being who has more power than you because like i remember even thinking about like those classes i was in like once you realize you're dealing with the supernatural once you think you're dealing with the supernatural force this is the evil that you're presented with if i can't make it go away well i'm just human i tried you know so now i'm gonna yeah. hopefully god can make it go away but i think when when you when you take something and you personalize it as opposed to demonize it now all of a sudden what tools do I have in my life and my belt that I can do to address this thing and try to make it and try to make this situation better? Now, all of a sudden, the responsibility is back on me. It's back on us. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So personal responsibility has to come in here. I do not think we're, we're, you know, pre-programmed in a particular way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that completely. Yeah. All right. Last question for you. Um, one of the things that I really admire about your work and that you've really helped me with is kind of helping Christians read these stories in a way that don't shame people who are Jewish and shame yeah. um, Judaism as a whole. And that's really one of your, I think your biggest passion points in all of your work is helping people read the New Testament stories, uh, particularly like pastors and just people who, you know, teach and th different things like that to not take these stories and do something with them that outcasts, you know, Jewish people. So one of the things I like, for instance, like the Pharisees, I know that's one of the big, the big topics people like to, you know, use the word Pharisee and have it refer to all Jewish people and, you know, all Jewish teachers and things like that. When you've pointed out in your work that the Pharisees that Jesus is coming up against are really just a small segment of people. It's not uh, representative of the entire Jewish world. And so one of the things I think with these particular stories, and you mentioned it in your book, is that a lot of times Christians and pastors can read these stories and use them in ways that um, shame Jewish people. So I was wondering if you could maybe give us um, an example of what that might look like, um, of how that might might look, and then also maybe talk to us a bit about how, as Christians, maybe pastors who are listening, teachers, can use, can steward these stories better uh, yeah. in a way that they present them to their congregations. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue of shaming. Hmm. I mean, if some pastor gets up in the pulpit and says something uh, stupid and erroneous and negative about Jews, I don't feel shamed. I feel annoyed. Hmm um because it's wrong right no um so look um pharisees are a very small percentage of the population however josephus who's not a pharisee he's a first century historian um mm -hmm. priestly descent um younger contemporary of jesus says that the people are actually listening to the pharisees mm -hmm. um and we have enough connections between what we know about the pharisees uh and what we know about rabbinic judaism to suggest that they're they're the through line Hmm. Um, from Second Temple Pharisaic practice into what, what eventually becomes kind of normative Judaism hmm. centuries later. Um, Pharisees, uh, there was in 2019 in May, a huge conference in Rome on the Pharisees, big international conference. I actually got a papal audience, which was hmm. great. Um, uh, and what this conference yielded was a book that came out last November from Erdman's that I co-edited with Joseph Sievers. Um, on who the Pharisees are and how we've understood them over time. So what do we know about the Pharisees? Well, we don't know as much as we would like. <laughs> the only Pharisee from whom we have written records is Paul of Tarsus. Uh, and Paul never gives up his Jewish identity. He never gives up his Pharisaic identity. He never calls himself a Christian because he's not. He doesn't know the word. Mm -hmm. um, he, he is a practicing Jew who is convinced that the Messianic age has arrived. Um, and he's trying to figure out what to do at the Messianic age when the Gentiles turn from their pagan gods to worship the God of Israel. You know, do they follow Torah? And his answer, which is a good Pharisaic answer, is no, you don't, because mm -hmm. the Torah wasn't wasn't designed to be followed by everybody. Mm -hmm. right? um, when Isaiah and Zechariah and even King Solomon predict that you know nations will stream to worship the God of Israel. And many people in tongues will worship God. Well, if they all convert to Jude Judaism, then they're all going to be Jews. And then you don't have many nations. You just got one. Mm. So Paul has to go out of his way to figure out how to make these Gentiles stay Gentiles, but no longer worship pagan gods. Disappointment. Pharisees um, were the liberalizers. They mm. were not the super conservatives. They were the ones who were saying, how do you take Torah, which was not written in our time period? It's a much older document. This is Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, how do you live this in our own society when we don't have political autonomy, mm -hmm. um, when we're, you know, when the Romans are in the country, when we're dealing with Hellenism, uh, mm -hmm. when we're dealing with Greek philosophy and all sorts of other things. And what the Pharisees do is they lighten things up. Right. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to the Pharisees as seekers after smooth things. You guys are looking for the easy way out. <laughs> and, think about, and you can see this in the divorce legislation where the Pharisees say to Jesus, um, you, you know, can you get divorced for any reason? Well, that's the question. Everybody knew you could get divorced because Deuteronomy says you can get divorced. The question was <laughs> under what circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, just adultery. She burns your dinner, something in between. You find somebody prettier. Um, and Jesus says, you know, it's because of your hardness of heart that Moses gave you this concession, mm -hmm. but God really wants you to stay together. 
Well, the concession model is actually the Pharisaic model. We can't do exactly what God wants us to do. So we're going to figure out how to do this more easily. Mm. Right. Um, so they're not the hardcore ultra conservative people. Jesus is more like a Sadducee here mm. than he is like a Pharisee. That really mm. freaks out my Christian friends. What do you mean he's like a Sadducee? <laughs> um, and, and in other cases, Jesus is more likely to take the hard line. Um, the Pharisees are also interested in extending priestly privileges from the priests in the temple to everybody, which is why they're interested in hand washing, because mm -hmm. the priests would wash their hands before touching the sacrificial element. So if we're all a kingdom of priests in a holy nation, thank you, Exodus, mm -hmm. repeated, by the way, in First Peter, then we should do what priests do so that our dining room table, they don't have dining rooms or tables, uh, but so that our meal would be like a meal in the temple. Okay, so you wash, everybody gets to wash their hands. And Jesus says, wait a minute, that's an innovation. That's mm. just for the priest. We're not going to do that. Mm. I'm kind of going with the Sadducees here because it's a little bit more of an egalitarian system mm. or the Pharisees, right? Yeah. So rabbinic documents are how do we do this in such a way that it helps sanctify daily life, your, mm. your practices, but they're not burdensome. They're joyful. That's yeah. what the Pharisees are interested in doing. Jesus has a different way of approaching Torah. Mm. Yeah. Which is what, more rigorous. Yeah. Yeah. What ways does this fall in line with the particular like stories of the signs and wonders of Jesus? Because and I forget where you mentioned in your book, but there was one example that you gave where a lot of times Christians will read one of the stories. It might have been like one of the feeding stories, I don't remember, but in such a way that, you know, it's it's like Jesus is coming against Jewish people oh, because yes. of well, the way he responded. Mm -hmm. The best example is the conjoined story of the woman with the hemorrhage and that was it, the, yeah. the ruler with the dead daughter. Yeah. Um, and the standard Christian reading is, oh, this woman who's hemorrhaging is ritually unclean, which she probably is. It's a vaginal or uterine hemorrhage. And that Jesus, by touching her, does away with Jewish purity laws. Mm -hmm. No. Um, first of all, he doesn't touch her. She touches him. Mm. Uh, and second of all, he doesn't do away with purity laws. He restores people to states of ritual purity. Mm. Um, there's no law against him touching her or her touching him. There's no law against her appearing in public. You know, it's not like every time a woman menstruates, they're, they're you know, left off in some hut somewhere and, and you know, the city shuts down for a month. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if Christians, if the Christian, many, many Christians view this, you know, women's purity is so contagious and icky and awful, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have one menstruating woman who, you know, would make anybody unclean if she touched this person, yeah, like one angry woman could collude all of Galilee and be like, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, menstruation is like, I'm 66, that, that's done and gone. <laughs> but but uh, it, probably too much information. But you know, <laughs> I, like, think of how many people I could just run around, touch people, unclean, unclean. I mean, right. The world doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, most people are impure most of the time. Most don't care. Oh, and when they think about Pharisees, the general view is that the word Pharisee comes from the Hebrew parush, which means to separate. And that means Pharisees are staying away from impurity and staying away from other people. And they're elitist. And, you know, oh, God, there's a woman who's impure. You know, run away if you're a Pharisee. <laughs> Well, first of all, we don't know where the name Pharisee comes from. Um, mm -hmm. It, could, it can, could come from another Hebrew root, which means to interpret. Mm -hmm. um, or if the idea is separate, then separate from what? Maybe separate from sin, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is this etymological fallacy. We don't know where the word comes from. Um, so what do we do? We say Jesus comes to do away with Torah law. Um, that's a Martin Luther reading. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's making Jews look like... Um, uh, you know, 15th, 16th century Catholics mm -hmm. and say, we don't do all those rituals. It's kind of silly, mm -hmm. um, which it's not. Rituals are what keep cultures coherent. So if the end of the sermon is Jesus does away with Torah, that's wrong. Jesus never does away with Torah. He never says the God of the Old Testament is a weak God and he's going to introduce a different one. Mm -hmm. um, he restores people to states of ritual purity. He even tells a person with leprosy whom he cleanses is probably eczema or seborrhea um, or psoriasis. You know, go show yourself to the priest and make the offering. That's following mm. Torah. Um, and when it comes to the, the broader commandments, like don't murder or don't commit adultery, Jesus says, don't be angry and don't think about adultery. That's mm. harder. Mm. So if you yank Jesus out of his Jewish context or you make that context epitomize whatever is awful and then Jesus comes to fix it, um, it it's a mischaracterization of Judaism. Uh, and it's a mischaracterization of Jesus because it's making him completely a historical. And finally, if the message to the people in the pew is, oh, well, thank God we're not like those Jews, that's not good news. And it's not yeah. good news for a variety of reasons. Mm.
Yeah. So what is your, what would be your advice then to somebody listening who maybe they are a pastor or they are responsible for presenting this material to uh, groups of people to guard against that type of interpretation? Because I know for myself, like even when I moved out of the more evangelical world where I experienced this kind of stuff a lot, and I feel, I feel like I picked up a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of that kind of language, a lot of that kind of baggage. It was very difficult for me to, to read a passage apart from that filter, I guess you could say mm-hmm. that I used to have. Like, what is your advice for somebody who's really, really wants to do better, wants to be a better steward of these stories and not do with them what, what you just described? Like, what, what are some different things they can do in order to get better? At you mean that? besides read everything I've written? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what I tell my students is picture my children. Um, I When my children were little, I used to bring them to class. Mm-hmm. Um, and they went to the Orthodox Jewish day school. So like my son had his, his kippah, his yarmulke and mm-hmm. his, his ritual fringes. It's easy, right? You know, um, and so I put my little kids in the front row and, and introduce them to my students and say, when you're preaching or teaching, I want you to picture these kids sitting in the front pew mm-hmm. and don't say anything that will hurt these children. And don't say anything that will cause a member of your congregation to hurt these children, which is mm-hmm. manipulative. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that doesn't work, picture me sitting in the back pew. Um, because if I hear the gospel being deformed, you bet I'm going to stand up during your sermon. And the last thing you want is an angry Jewish woman standing up with her hands folded, making frowny faces at the back of the church. Right. And you bet I'm going to be in your face at the meet and greet. Mm. Um, so don't do that. Yeah. Right. Try to figure out what the good news is. Um, and some of the worst sermons I've heard um, come from very liberal Christians who have given up some of that m- more problematic baggage. Yeah. Um, and so Jesus is the social justice warrior. And in order to get Jesus to be the social justice warrior, they got to find something wrong with Judaism because Jesus does sure. not spend a whole lot of time talking about Rome. Mm-hmm. So Judaism represents, uh, you know, if you're wealthy, you're righteous and Jesus affirms the poor. Well, mm-hmm. Jews don't think that. And if you just go back to the Old Testament all the way through to rabbinic literature today, that's also the case, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or Jews invented misogyny and, and Jesus invented feminism. Mm-hmm. Well, gee, well, how come we have books like Esther and Ruth and Judith. I mean, really? Um, <laughs> so try not to set up a negative foil in order to, to impose on Jesus your own agenda. Yeah. Have a conversation with the text and don't yank him out of his own context. And if you want to take a post-colonial reading or an ideological critical reading, all that stuff's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Um, remember that he's also part of a culture. And if all you do is read him from your own social location, you're colonizing him. Yeah, it's probably not a good way of proceeding. Yeah, colonizing Jesus has never, never ends up good. <laughs> probably not. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let it be a conversation. Yeah. Read from your own subject position, but also give him credit for being embedded in his own subject position. Yeah, a conversation. And I think too, I mean, ask someone with Jewish roots, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've done that. Like in the last couple of years, like I've met people who are Jewish, and I'll ask them a question, like, "Hey." I'm reading this story. This is why I was always taught about it. I feel like that might not be right. Like, tell me your thoughts on it. And having that conversation with somebody else who has a much different perspective than you can really expand your mind and how you think about and understand the story. It's also really fun because I mean, this is what I do for a living. Um, mm. Now that I'm teaching at Hartford and I'm doing this in online in June, um, I have a bunch of Jewish students in my classes because Hartford is interested in Jewish, Christian, Muslim conversation. Mm. So to read a New Testament passage with a bunch of Christians, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, um, Baptist, and then you got Jews in the class and you got Muslims in the class and they're asking different questions of the same text. And sometimes they're really, really disagreeing, but the text can bear both readings. Yeah. That's a good conversation. That's really interesting. And then it, it also showed, I would think it also shows like what maybe one culture might see something in a story that the other culture might not see. And then mm-hmm. all different points can get magnified from that from that single right. text. And I've also yeah. found that, you know, even from Americans, that people in their 60s see different things than people in their 20s. Yeah. Because yeah. they're asking different questions. People right. who study foreign languages, um, who can read Greek, uh, will see different things than people who are just using the English translation. And yeah. sometimes the English translations can give rise to certain readings that can't be supported by the Greek. And then what do you do? Yeah. Um, so it's all quite fascinating to me. Mm. Um, we all bring, by the way, different intertexts 
you know, so mm. you read a, a, a miracle story. Well, how does that relate to Noah and the ark? Or how does that relate to the healings of the prophets Elijah and Elisha? Mm. Or to rabbis who do miracle work? Or to, how does the wedding at Cana relate to the Dionysus cult, the cult of the god of wine? Mm. So whatever intertext you bring in is also going to spin the story in a new way. And since there are more intertexts than we can ever count, there will be more readings of the gospel than we can ever count either. Yeah. That's so good. AJ, you always, you always, you always mesmerize me. <laughs> I'm happy talking about this and, and you thank give me you. the opportunity to do so. So thank you. you. Now, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me and uh, always, of course, for your work. Real quick, is there anything, is there anything new that you're working on now? Is there anything that we can expect coming down the pipeline? Yep. I'm trying to finish up a manuscript uh, called, the tentative title is Jesus for Everyone. It's almost done. Mm. Uh, it is due Thanksgiving Day and I'm going to make it. There you go. Uh, I've already written everything except for the conclusion. So now it's just a matter of putting in some footnotes. Um, and then I will turn for Abington for a, a beginner's guide series, a beginner's guide to the gospel of Mark. Okay. And instead of Fine. doing it as most people do thematically, like Mark on yeah. disciples and Mark on Jesus and Mark on the passion, I'm just going to take people through the gospel and say, here's how you read a gospel. And it's an opportunity of looking at stories that I haven't looked at in some of the other, the other Bible books. So for people who want to read the gospel of Mark and have a guide to go with them, yeah. uh, help them ask maybe new questions or see new things. I'm really looking forward to getting getting really solid work done on that in December. I love it. Well, I'm excited. You have some invites to come back here and talk about both of those things. <laughs> I'd be absolutely delighted. I look forward to the next time. Awesome. Thank you so much, AJ. Most welcome.